Okay, okay we're, we're recording now. Thank you, Heidi. All right, um, now you need to know, besides, let's just go back a moment, and we've talked about analytic cubism. This is analytic cubism, and it has to do with breaking down an object and space into basic flat planes, interweaving space and form together, analyzing space and form. All right? Simultaneous viewpoints or multiple viewpoints. Uh, so you're seeing, you're seeing this woman or this man called Portuguese from different directions. This is analytic cubism. Now, there's another type of cubism here, and it's called synthetic. Uh, synthetic is putting things together. And so you're taking materials from different places, and you're constructing and putting things together. This is still life with chair caning. The chair caning is that thing that looks like a, a seating of a, of a chair. It's a photographic image right here. It's an actual piece of rope. And I think there are some papers that are pasted in there as well as paint. So the interesting part about synthetic cubism is combining different materials together. And so what we're looking at, the word collage, which we all know, has to do with to stick and to stick um, bits of objects like newspaper and cloth, etc., together to create a, a composition. And this is the first time it's been done. And so we have here five pieces of printed and colored paper that are overlapping. And the flat, the layering of the flat planes or the flat pieces of paper, and when you think of a plane, uh, uh, it's like a flat piece of paper. Um, they kind of layer and they push and pull. It's almost like analytic cubism, the way they're but they're not trying to analyze space. It's more decorative, okay? It's more decorative. Now, the other idea that you need to know is that uh, with synthetic cubism, they're using materials that um, are mass-produced, such as photographs and newspapers and, and rope, and they're putting them together, um, and they're creating a new medium, mixed media. And... This was unheard of up until now because high art, this is not high art where you take newspaper and actually incorporate it into a composition. Quiet, we're Can recording. <laughs> all right, um, all right, sculpture, cubist sculpture. <clears throat> um, cubist sculpture is very similar in that there's an attempt to simplify. An abstraction is to radically simplify, radically stylize, whether it's flat planes or curved planes. Um, and so um, we're going to see that the cubist sculpture, like Pablo Picasso's uh, uh, maquette, which is a model for a guitar, larger. Um, this is made out of cardboard. I think his larger one was uh, going to be made out of, of steel, flat steel. But this is very planar, flat planes. Uh, you can see the interior of the of the um, guitar as well as the exterior. So we're we're looking inside, we're looking outside, and he's using um, materials uh, that like wire and string and cardboard, which which are mass-produced materials that, that are being used instead of canvas and paint and so forth. So this is a modern aesthetic. This is a modern sensibility. They're finding objects and they're making art out of them. This one by Jacques Lipschitz is a, um, it looks most like analytic cubism. You know, viewpoints, no single viewpoint. You're looking in different directions. And um, the, the, the book did talk about, they made a connection between the twisting tension of this with Giovanni's Mannerist sculpture that um, um, we've talked about, the rape of the Sabine women. And during the late Renaissance, late, you know, which is late 16th century, right? Late Renaissance, the Mannerists. Um, but you can see him breaking everything down into cubes or into flat planes that make cubes. Um, and Archipenko uh, is a woman combing hair. These are curved planes. What is significant is the head. The head has become a void. The head is shaped by the arm and the hair. But it's, what it means is that space is just as important. The negative space is just as important as the positive form. So space and form get kind of merged together. 
And so um, you need to understand that. And here, um, this is, geez, not two women clothing here. There's something wrong with that. Oh, bather. Sorry, mistake on my part. This is called bather. Of course it's bather. And this is a woman combing her hair. Um, and so with this one, there's no single, um, well, the previous one, there's no single point of view. But Ar Arkopenko, um, you have this, oh, no, this is Gonzalez, sorry. I'm going to sound like a fool on the recording, but... Um, there's uh, again new materials. This is this is the the main point that you need to understand. He is using prefabricated metal pieces um, that are made for industry, uh, for whatever uh, ready-made bars and sheets and rods of iron and bronze, and he's using this to create um, a sculpture. And this is the modern aesthetic. They're using new materials. It's very spatial. There's a lot of space here and very linear. Uh, just quickly with this fellow, he is called a tubist, not a cubist. Um, he did this kind of clean geometric shapes, modern machinery. It's an industrial landscape. And um, it's, um, you know, you have these polished me metallic uh, shapes. They have pistons and cylinders and these robotic humanoid uh, shapes. All right, um, not as important as this. This is the it Italian movement called Futurism, and it happened in 1909 to 1919. And you, as you can guess, it's it's right before World War One, and also it's during World War One, and it has to do with a movement that is aligned with the machine age, um, and with. The idea of speed and the idea of, of steel and machines. And um, so they had adapted some of the analytic devices of cubism, breaking things down into facets. But there's more movement here. And it has to do with the modern life of machines. Just think about it. The turn of the century, the automobile, the airplane, moving pictures called cinema, movies. All right? So there's mo motion here, and you, we see it. Uh, the wonders of the machine age, the beauty of speed. Um, and they also had a subversive uh, philosophy. Subversive meaning breaking down, destroying. They wanted to destroy the old world and usher in a new world. And so there's this element of destroying the cult of the past and every form of imitation. All right, we're talking about the Renaissance tradition again. And uh, we, um, they want to glorify um, this age of movement. Everything moves. So this one here uh, shows, I call it multiple views. They call it simultaneous views. You know, this, this was unique for the time, 1912. The actual seeing the motion of a walking person with their dog on a leash. Um, and so... This has to do with um, a phenomenon that's called persistence of vision. And I will talk about that because I do need to talk about photography a little bit. Persistence of vision has to do with when you look at something and then you look away, it stays in your mind a fraction of a second longer. So you can kind of uh, see motion. So we'll talk about that later. But this is... Um, uh, it's called Dynamism of Dog on a Leash. Uh, not as important as this one. This is very important. I think this is at MoMA. Erberto Boccioni. Unique forms of continuity in space. Now, if you look at this, it looks so atypical of most of the sculpture we have seen so far. Most of the sculpture is static and solid and stable. It doesn't move. Um, and this is quite different. There is a great sensation of movement. It depicts a powerful male in full stride. And actually, it's a metaphor for the Italian male moving forward uh, into the future, headlong into the future. This Italian futurism was a um, male chauvinist group. And um, so the figure is confidently striding forward. 
um, you can see there is rippling effect. Um, it almost looks like little flags are coming off his body. You can see the motion of his, um, as if he's taking this stride forward. So you, you see this. Um, and so we've seen things like this. The, this one here, uh, the victory of Samothrace, we have talked about this in terms of movement. Hellenistic sculpture was sculpture that moved, not necessarily classical um, Greek, but Hellenistic Greek. And it's, I just wanted to show that in a, to you as a kind of a means of uh, review. And then look at this. These are all sculptures that are atypical of most sculptures we see. These are sculptures that twist and turn and move. And, and I don't know, I missed Michelangelo's David because he, there's a certain action in repose, right? The action in repose, there is, there is a movement that wants to happen. It doesn't because it's classical Renaissance. But these are moving. There's a sense of energy here that you don't necessar necessarily see. In, um, in Renaissance uh, or classical depiction of, of sculpture. Rodin is here, Bernini is here, um, and uh, Nike and, okay. This is Italian Futurism too. It's called the Armored Train. The, the positive effects of the industrial age is all these wonderful machinery, but when a nation wants to defend itself, all that technology is converted into destructive weapons of that, that of mass destruction, weapons of mass destruction. And this is an armored train. New weapons like flamethrowers, I'm talking about World War I, flamethrowers, tanks, machine guns, you know, mustard gas, all from this industrial revolution, mass slaughter, madness of World War I. So here we have this high tech uh, for that time, armored train with soldiers on it, as you can see the cannon. And they're glorifying war because they think war will purge and, and, and destroy the old world of the past and bring in the new. Remember, it's the 20th century. Big, it's a big deal. And so the Italians wanted things to change. And, and you see action. You see facets and movement and speed. And that's what it's about. Okay? So that's the end of chapter one. Uh, no, that's the end of part one of chapter 35. And then uh, I'm going to move to... Part two, which is art that a lot of people don't understand, but it's not hard to understand if we just think about it. It has to do, once again, with the historical context. It has to do with the insanity of war and a world war. And these are called Dadists. Dadists um, are a group of artists that became, well, the futurists, they glorified in war. The Dadists were revolted and disgusted with mass destruction. They were horrified, and they were angry. And they were angry with the world of rationalism. The Industrial Revolution is based on rational thinking, scientific thinking, scientific enlightenment. Okay, So they wanted to become irrational. They wanted to become absurd. It was an anti-logical observation uh, movement anti-logical it was based it's it's our tradition of we've talked about it before it's the it's the um, baroque uh, romantic type of approach where emotion is more important intuition uh, and so forth so as it says here um, the insanity and butchery of World War one um, and so it uh, they believed that reason and logic had been responsible for the disaster of the war. And so they revolted against that. Uh, so what they did, they did these things to shake us up, to try to help us to see what, what are we doing? You know, we're supposed to be rational thinking. It, it, it's be, rationalism has betrayed us. So... Um, it has created widespread suffering and destruction of the human spirit. So um, it's, it's art that is absurd and illogical. And so you're going to see some strange things here. It, but it's basically called anti-art. For instance, the, the leader of anti-art is Marcel Duchamp. He took this very revered painting by Leonardo and put a mustache and a goatee on her 
because he was making a political statement of the snobbery that is in the art world for overvalued you know art you know very expensive and so he's making a he's making a statement here and um, but he he does even stranger things um, this type of art was influenced by psychoanalysts and you've heard of Sigmund Freud maybe uh, he believed in the exploration of the unconscious and interpretation of dreams. Where dreams are really suppressed feelings that you have. And Carl Jung was another one. So you need to be inf understand that the psychoanalysis analysis of the time were influencing the exploration of the unconscious mind. All right, which is when you're unconscious and when you dream, you have no control. They like that. The artists, the Dadists, liked not to have control. They wanted the unconscious to be unleashed. And so they created things called, techniques called automatism and chance. So, for instance, automatism. And have you ever been on the phone and talking? And then you almost automatically, without thinking, you have a pencil in your hand or a pen and you start doodling. Okay? That's, and you start to do things, write or do pictures automatically without thinking about it that's called automatism it's an automatic or unconscious action or creation right that's one of the techniques they that the dadists use they also use chance chance and this is what gene arp did it's called collage arranged according to the laws of chance what he did did was put a piece of paper on the floor then he tore pieces of paper and then he dropped them he did not think of it consciously. He just dropped them. Um, and wherever they hit the paper, he glued them on. So there's this element of chance. What they're doing is they, 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 re they, they reject control of the conscious mind. And instead, they're trying to tap into the unconscious. And they do that with the automatism, and they do that with chance. OK? All right, we're going to see more. The father of this type of art is called, his name is Marcel Duchamp. And um, we're going to talk about him in, in a little bit. But here, uh, he is, he believes, and it's, I know it's strange, but he's the father of conceptual art. It's a term you're going to have to know. It's a 20th century term. Conceptual art, concept is idea. Before you actually make something, you have an idea, an idea in your head. He believed that the idea in your head was more important than the finished work. So he believed in the art of ideas. Now, I know this is strange, but when we go to MoMA, we're going to see things like this. We're going to see conceptual art where the idea is more important. Anyway, he, he made this. He went into a, um, uh, a store and he... Uh, and he saw a manufactured snow shovel at a hardware store. And he looked at it and he said, wow, what a beautiful object. And he said, why, why can't that beautiful object that was designed by some industrial designer, why can't that be considered art? So he took that shovel and signed it and he said, here, it's art. So what he's doing is he's redefining our definition of art. So this is another ready-made. A ready-made is something that is already manufactured, a stool, and a bicycle wheel. And he takes it and he puts he takes those two elements that have been manufactured beforehand and he puts them together and he makes something new. He dislocates them. He, he in other words, he takes them away from their function. Function of the stool like I'm sitting on. The bicycle wheel part of a bike, but he takes two disparate objects and puts them together and he creates an idea. No one's ever seen this idea before. This is new. It's the idea that's important. Putting the two together creates something new. So the most radical of all his work was called the fountain. This is a men's urinal. And it's manufactured commercially, industrially, for a function, right? It's a function. All the guys know about it. It's beautiful, though. That's what Marcel Duchamp looked at it and said, it's a beautiful shape. Why don't I turn it around and sign it like an artist, a, a fictitious name, R. Mutt, and sign it and a date it, and then title it The Fountain. 
Now it's a work of art. Putting it on a pedestal, it's a sculpture. Now people saw this and they were, you know, they were really shocked by it. But he's saying, he's trying to help us understand that maybe thinking of art traditionally might not be the best way. Uh, maybe we've got to look at things differently because the way we looked at art resulted in mass destruction and war. We've got to get rid of the old ways of thinking. And that's what the Dadaists did. And so um, this is what he wrote. Whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain or not has no importance. He chose it. He took an ordinary article of life, placed it so that its useful significance disappears under a new title and a new point of view. Okay, the fountain, and so um, uh, so he uses, you know, he kind of he does he does kind of consciously think he turns it around, and I know that, but uh, there, he u does use some elements of chance and uh, with this. All right, Hannah Hawk, uh, this is the birth of photo montage or photo collage. And it happened during, uh, she's uh, a German, and happened during the uh, Weimar um, Republic. We we Weimar? What? Weimar. Weimar. Can, and can anyone tell me anything about the history of the Weimar Republic? Um, a little louder, please. Uh, this was after World War I, uh, One. and the harsh buildings like put on them. And during that time, there was a lot of unrest in Germany, a lot of, you know, especially economic turmoil because of um, the ITU basically accept all of the blame for World War One, and they had to pay, like, repairments to the um, Allied countries. And as such, that led to economic turmoil, which basically gave Hitler a foothold to the Exactly. Now, look at her. Look at this photo collage. And a photo montage is a collection of different pictures from different sources that are put together in a composition. She borrowed them from books and newspapers and posters and leaflets, leaflets like that. It's chaotic. It is, it's, and this was what she was trying to say. Um, you know, the Weimar Republic was corrupt and it was inept, and um, it created inflation, and it, you know, uh, like Stacy said, it opened the door for Hitler and the, and the Nazis and fascists. So, um, and so she's using chance and dislocation. Dislocation is taking things out of their context and putting them in a new surrounding, all right? So you, take, you, cut, you cut things out from different magazines and you put them in a different place. That's dislocating. And she's, I don't know, sometimes she's consciously trying to put them together, but sometimes she's using chance. Sometimes she's using automatism where she says, I'm just going to put these here. All right? So that's what that is. Kurt Schwitters, he is the original recycler. Kurt Schwitters would walk around the streets of, An of um, Anover and Germany, uh, and he would pick up uh, cluttered, discarded junk like bus, bus tickets, buttons, shreds of paper, thread, and he would create these beautiful compositions. He would, he would use found objects, okay? Again, this is the new aesthetic, the modern aesthetic, um, where you're finding objects and uh, you're reorganizing, but it's non-traditional objects. It's Absurd. It's a, you know, it's it's illogical, taking junk and making art out of junk, and that again, that is a Dadaist approach, and he's hoping to get new meaning uh, from these. And he called them MERS, M-E-R-Z. It's up there. MERS nineteen. I, I've seen that question uh, as a multiple choice question. What did Kurt Schwitters call his composition? MERS. MERS. Uh, it's up there. M-E-R-Z. Okay. Would you mind if we went a little further? Um, a little further? Okay. Uh, maybe for 10 minutes? Yeah. Good. Okay, or 15? Okay. All right. So, um, 
what is America doing at this time? We're over in Europe, and we're calling this European modernism. All right? How does America react? What is America doing at the time? Well, this is the paintings that are happening during this time. This is realism. America is still in the same period uh, that we have uh, in, from 1850 to 1900 in Europe. It's, it's realism, OK? Um, and so these are subjects taken from the real world, right? That's part of the, the credo of realism is, is subject matter, is ordinary subject matter, like a woman on top of a tenement of an apartment uh, complex in the city and, and um, pinning her laundry out on a line. Uh, so, so one of the, um, this group is called, um, in America, they, they, there was this group called the Ashcan School. And the Ashcan School depicted very, they, most of it was in New York City, and they depicted the subject matter was bleak and the seedy aspects of New York City, the ugly aspects. In fact, they were called the Apostles of Ugliness. And this is John Sloan. He's, he's famous. You see up here on the right, the boxing, the boxer on the right. Um, he's known for those paintings, but the book has this one here. And this is an intersection uh, of 6th Avenue and 30th Street. Uh, he loved the working class as subject matter. And this is a, um, an area on the outskirts of the Tenderloin District in New York City, known for its brothels and dance halls, salons, gambling dens, and cheap hotels. And you have people from several walks of life. Um, you have, uh, he captures a realistic slice of urban life. He has uh, a drunken uh, woman in a white shabby dress. She's, they ha he has two prostitutes walking along and then two well-dressed men looking at them. Uh, but it's, it's, it's reality, all right? This is what America was doing while in Europe, all this, this, this kind of abstract um, modernism that was happening, okay? But it changed. And it changed with a very influential art show in America that you need to know. It happened in 1913. You can't see 1913 because I have white on white, but it's called the Armory Show in New York City. In the Armory, the old Armory in New York City, it held a show, and it was a show of the modern masters of Europe, and so they had key works that young Americans came to see of the Impressionists, of the Post-Impressionists, of the Fauves, of the Cubists, of the German Expressionists. And America, for the first time, saw this modern movement in Europe, their first pu public uh, look at what was going on over on the other side of the ocean. And a lot of people thought it was a joke. And a lot of th people thought it was immoral. Uh, and it was just going, you know, going downhill. Art is, is going downhill. So here's the Armory Show. Um, here are some of the artists that they saw. Matisse, uh, Duran of the Fauves, we, uh, Van Gogh, Cezanne, uh, maybe some Kandinsky. They saw these guys. Here's some more that they saw. Uh, they saw the Cubists. They, saw, they even saw the Fountain by Marcel Duchamp. Marcel Duchamp uh, actually showed uh, had another one that was a scandalous, more scandalous than this. And here it is. Whoops. And here it is. Uh, this is New Descending a Staircase. This was the buzz of the show for some reason. People were enraged that they could not find, they couldn't see the figure uh, in the painting. It was entitled New Descending a Staircase. You can see that it looks a lot, it has, shows its debt to cubism and futurism. Critics called it an explosion in a shingle factory. Um, remember, the American public still believed that painting and art had to do with classical and the Renaissance tradition of beautiful paintings, uplifting paintings, idealistic paintings. Uh, this was scandalous. Take a look up on the top. I, I found these um, on, um, in a Google search. There's a newspaper clip uh, 
of a little cartoon scandalizing and lampooning and uh, the painting, and th they actually made a post uh, a stamp out of it as well, of uh, the Armory Show. So uh, here we have this um, public officials demanded the show be shut down to safeguard public morals. Um, and so, but it also shows the painting was influenced by moving pictures because it does look like that. It looks like moving pictures. Um, okay, I'm, and just a few more. Uh, American reaction to European modernism. And here's some more reactions. Look at this one. Now, which of the art movements we just talked about do you think this guy was influenced by? Dadaists. Do you see this one? Um, it is an, uh, look at it. Subversive means to undermine and destroy. Look at this. It's a very functional iron, old fashioned, but it's an iron. And he glued tacks on it. Now, is that iron functional anymore? No. It's ironic that he does that. And he's he's this is what Dada is about. It's about chance and dislocating. He they took tacks and dislocated them, moved them to I'm tacked them on, glued them onto an iron. So it what you see here, it's very edgy and it's almost malicious in its humor. He purchased the iron, and then he pressed, and then he um, glued on the tax. It's almost defeating the purpose, the functional purpose. It's uh, kind of an ironic tradition uh, contradiction. It's called the gift. Look how he well, look what he named it. That's not a gift for anybody. Um, so, yeah. Oh, it's an iron onic. Okay, a little louder so you can be on the recording. All right, very good. Um, all right, so um, that's Man Ray. He's got a strange name, too. Man Ray. No, not SpongeBob, Man Ray. Okay, um, let's, let's do just do a couple more. Uh, I'm going to end it soon. Uh, this is Marston Hartley, and it's called Portrait of a German Soldier. And he is using um, a type of art where he flattens everything out, it's like it's almost like synthetic cubism. Now there's another another uh, direction of synthetic cubism, and you have it here. This is this painting here on the on the right is the Three Musicians by Pablo Picasso. Another aspect of besides be collaging things together, the, another aspect of synthetic cubism is um, it's flatter planes, and they don't interpenetrate; they just interlock. They don't penetrate each other like the analytic cubism. They interlock their simple, flattened planes that are very colorful and decorative. So he gets his inspiration from uh, what's called synth uh, the other aspect of synthetic cubism. This is Marston Hartley. Uh, and so what we have here is uh, he is immersed in military imagery. Uh, it He had a German lover who was a, a soldier in the army. Uh, his name was Lieutenant Carl von Freiburg. And you probably see, maybe his, I thought his initials were in there. Yeah, there it is. Carl von Freiburg. There's his initials. Um, and um, he's got military imagery like German imperial flag. He's got badges like an iron cross. Um, these had personal significance because his lover, um, unfortunately, died in battle and he lost his life at the age of 24, and that's why we have 24. I think there's a 2-4. Yep, there's the 2-4. Um, and he was in the 4th Regiment, and that's why number 4 is there. Um, but the point is he's using synthetic cubism, flat decorative. And, you know, Marston Hartley was an American. All right, so that's what you need to know. Uh, one more, and that'll be it. Stuart Davis is an American, and he did synthetic cubism. Um, and so his are very colorful, decorative, flat. Um, and during this period of time in the 20s, the jazz age, this was the jazz age, with t jazz tempos and, and lots of movement and, and lots of improvisation, do you know how jazz, you, you know what I mean by improvisation? 
scatting, kind of making it up without a without a composition in front of you, and you're feeling your way along. It's intuitive. Do oh, you understand that, guys? Yeah. Okay. So that's what we're looking at here, and with uh, Marston Hartley, um, he um, he uses uh, a uh, flat colored shapes showing, um, like for instance, Lucky Strike was a, he really enjoyed the commercial designing of uh, packaging products. And so he kind of used that uh, to create this painting called Lucky Strike. All right. The other ones, these here are just some of his other, you know, full of, of energy and um, but his packaging, he would really enjoy packaging. Commercial art was just beginning in the in the um, in during this particular time, and also jazz. Uh, one other thing, and that is it for sure. I'm sorry. One more. Um, Aaron Douglas, another significant artist, because Aaron Douglas was an African American, and so you need to be aware of that because all we've talked about is white males and then we started talking about some women artists and now we're talking about we're starting to become more we start to see opportunities and recognition for um, you know a more culturally diverse population and racially diverse population so um, with with um, yeah oh, wow. yeah Sorry. yeah what is the Harlem Renaissance can you can you um, do you have any um, ideas it's like a cultural like surge that took place in Harlem New York based in the African-American population with like music writing art they became more prominent and what precipitated the um, uh, the growth of, of Harlem the black community of Harlem what it was migration. Migration. They migrated from where? The South. Why did they migrate from the South? African American. Job opportunities. Job opportunities be in, in defensive plants and factories, military factories, because it was World War I, and a lot of the white males were off at war, so the factories were filled with African Americans that had a chance to make a good living, had a chance to get away from the persecution of the South, and women were in factories as well. So um, there was this huge migration called the Great Migration. And, um, you know, I'll get back to Aaron Douglas, that we'll pick this up in class. But this, um, uh, I just wanted you to note that he used synthetic cubism, flat transparent planes of color. He enjoyed uh, subject matter from Bible. Uh, the, this is Noah's Ark. Uh, we'll get back to him, OK? All right. Um, yes. We'll continue from here, OK? Is that all right? Yes. All right, I'm not going to stop. Um, I'm going to continue. Is that okay? Do you want me to stop? Should I stop? Okay. How do I stop? You go to the top of the